Hi, I'm Laurel Gillespie, Director of Advanced Care Planning in Canada Initiative with the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association. And today we'll be having a conversation with Andrew Saunderson from Fraser Health Authority in British Columbia. We'll begin this event um, creating your joy list with advanced care planning by acknowledging that we're meeting on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. In particular, we acknowledge the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Ashinabeg people. Andrew Saunderson is a registered social worker who has been in both acute care and community settings in the areas of oncology, cardiology, HIV, AIDS, and substance use. Throughout his career, Andrew has consistently engaged in the implementation of advanced care planning. Andrew finds joy in both learning and teaching and has attended and facilitated various advanced care planning and serious illness conversational educational events. Today, we're speaking about joyless and how they provide comfort and important lessons during the span of one's life. Welcome, Andrew, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share in a conversation with us about joy and Thanks, joyless. Laura. Yeah, it's great. It's great to be here. Can I start, Laurel, by even just acknowledging the land that I'm on, because I'm obviously here in British Columbia. Um, and so I'd love, I'd love to acknowledge the unceded and traditional lands of the Katsi and the Kwantlen First Nations people as, and uh, just express some sincere gratitude uh, for the stewardship and the care that they've offered this land historically, continue to offer it, and will continue to offer it in the future. Beautifully said, Andrew. Thank you for sharing that. And that's the the hard one of the challenges about Zoom meetings. We're on, you know, sort of. I'm not at the exact opposite end of the country, but part way through. So we're many provinces apart. And so I thank you for that and honoring um, our Aboriginal and First Nations people. So I'd like to ask you a few questions. I'm really intrigued about your concept of creating joyless and and helping people find their joy and creating joy and and just that whole sense of discovery. So I, I'm, I'll start the conversation out today. Um, I hope you brought your tea or, or something to refresh yourself with, but um, something that we often like to ask people at the beginning of these conversations is, how were you first introduced to the concept of advanced care planning? Sure, it's a great question. I think informally, um, I, I don't think I knew it was advanced care planning that I was doing, but when I was working in the field of HIV, uh, uh, for years, both into the Toronto and the Vancouver area, you can appreciate that if you're HIV positive, uh, more or less your public, you've received a mandate from public health to take your antiretroviral medication in order to reduce the spread of HIV. And so when I worked both as an outreach worker and then also within a clinic setting, um, it was the nurses and the doctors who were primarily focused on ensuring that they were taking their medication. But as a social worker, I had the luxury of sitting down with my clients and asking them the why behind the taking the medication. What was more interesting to me wasn't that you, whether or not they were or were not taking their medication, it was, uh, why are we helping you live longer? What is it about living longer that's important to you? Because it's not enough for me to just help you to live, you know, it's not, it's not just about the quantity of life, it's about the quality of life too. And so for me, those were the conversations that I would have with my clients that would often catch them off guard as they entered a healthcare system where they felt was only interested in helping them live longer and didn't care very much about what kind of living longer. And so for me, I would always start my conversations by just asking them, what is it that brings you joy? And, and that question to them, again, was an opportunity, especially for a lot of the folks that I worked with who uh, had a history of homelessness or were actively using substances. It was a question that really led to some good self-reflection. And then for me as a social worker to help advocate and ensure that we were able to still achieve those things that were so important to them. So that was kind of informally, I had no idea I was doing advanced care planning. I had no idea that by helping people discover their values or what was important to them, or what brought them joy was going to help them make good healthcare decisions um, and inform their decision making. That was that was an obscure concept until I started working formally here in British Columbia as part of Fraser Health. Part of my orientation as a social worker was to attend um, a six-hour advanced care planning training. And to be honest, I had attended. This was ten years into my career. I had attended a number of education sessions, and this was possibly the most riveting and what felt the, like the most um, appropriate and helpful education I had ever attended. And so I left that training really passionate and excited to really go back again to a healthcare system that's far too often just focused on 
quantity of life and to start focusing on this quality of life and these kind of conversations that we we've classified as difficult but really aren't as difficult if we actually just take the time um, to, to have them and to start them. That's really, really, really interesting that you were you were just intuitively um, seeking to get that kind of information to really get to know who the individual was and at the core of it, what 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 brought them joy or what made them happy in their existence. And as you mentioned, like sometimes they would come from you know circumstances that wouldn't be what we would want or envision for ourselves or any of our loved ones, but you know for whatever reason that's where they were, but yet they were still trying to stay alive and, and be as healthy we're, as they could be. We're, we're all trying to have joy, right? Like I, I believe no matter our life circumstances, nobody wakes up in the morning hoping that it's going to be a terrible day. We're all waking mm -hmm. up hoping that it's going to be a great day and there's going to be some form of joy um, no matter what that looks like and how subjective that might be. So just in terms of context, I'm curious um, with advanced care planning, what timeline would that have been? How long ago was that for the you? The actual training? Yeah, when you when you first yeah, came the out education. Fresh so and, yeah. That would have been about seven years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. about seven years ago. So really about the same time that, um, you know, we started with the uh, the first initiative under the leadership of Louise Hanvey um, with CHPCA when she first started uh, to, to create a presence of advanced care planning in Canada at a national level. So, um, so I understand that you have a young daughter um, and how important has advanced care planning been for you and, and your family and, and finding your joy and... Yeah, no, it's a great question. So I, I have a six and a half year old daughter uh, who is often, her stories often very easily make their way into my conversations about advanced care planning. Um, and I have a one year old son uh, now as well. The idea of having kids, you know, it's interesting because when I, when I transition into my role of, of no longer working in acute care and now predominantly being an advanced care planning clinician, um, it was my daughter who was five at the time or maybe four and a half who was curious what do I do now because her definition of her dad as a social worker before was my dad helped sick people be happy um, and so I remember as we were driving in the car one time um, and she was like daddy what do you do now and I said well I don't work in the hospital anymore I do what's called advanced care planning and you can appreciate the uh, the stare of I don't know what the heck you're talking about dad look from a five-year-old and so I just turned to her while we were driving and I said, well, Capri, that's her name. I said, Capri, what is it that makes you happy? Tell me three things that make you happy. And she was able to very, very quickly say, well, that's easy. Playing with my friends, playing with my toys and riding my bike. And I asked her, I said, well, Capri, if you were able to, if you were ever to get really sick and we had to go to the doctor and the doctor said you needed to take some medicine. What if we asked the doctor if you were still able to do those three things, either while you're taking the medicine or for sure after you take the medicine, would you take that medicine? And she looked at me with like, of course I would, daddy, because I would still be able to do those three things that make me happy. And so for me, I just love that even kids get that we make decisions based on what makes us happy. And so having children, for me, advanced care planning, well, so much of it is yes, planning in advance for the healthcare that I would want, especially when I am sick with a serious illness or at the end of life. I also feel like good advanced care planning is also to help me make healthcare decisions along the way. And so right now, for example, I'm, I'm coping with a knee injury, but it wasn't until I realized the values or why I wanted to get it better that I did anything about it. I might be that typical male who wasn't seeing the doctor for three months while I was getting in more and more pain with my knee, until my daughter jumped out of the car one day, dropping her off for kindergarten and said, let's run to the school. And I couldn't run. And in that moment, I realized that that was what was important to me. And so I made a healthcare decision in that moment after dropping her off to call my doctor and to start doing some therapy to be able to improve that situation. So I think having kids and having a family definitely informs like what your values are, what's important to you and, and how important that planning in advance so I can keep enjoying my time with my family um, is important to me. Wow, uh, and it really, it, that, it was so simple just having that little conversation with Capri that if she gets it, surely other people will get it too. But, and you know, it's hard to figure out sometimes for me, like similar kind of circumstance, it was a personal experience. So I'm a cancer survivor. 
Um, I raised a child who has um, autism spectrum disorder. And I also um, was a care provider to my mother-in-law who had dementia and lived with us for six and a half years. All of this at the same time as a military wife with no family and supports around, it was very, very difficult. Um, but it really made me pause to reflect on, well, what really matters? And I had my own company at the time and I closed the, the doors of it because that didn't matter. But spending quality time with my kids um, and my family was so, so greatly important. And that's when I first became aware of it. And that was 13 years ago now, knock on wood. Um, but it really made me think about, well, what would I want to do if I was if, if, I, if I don't get better from chemotherapy and radiation and surgeries and, 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 what do I really want? And um, then I, I became committed that I will do what I can to ensure that other people are able to discover for themselves what it is that gives their life meaning and purpose. And like you say, what brings you joy? What really is at the core of what makes you who you are and what brings you true, um, what enriches your life every day on a daily basis? So well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Sorry, well, go ahead. Can I add to that, Laura? I think, yeah, I think that's sure. where we, I think that's where we complicate advanced care planning, and and what makes it feel like what creates a, a significant psychological barrier to even engaging in it is that we feel like we have to decide in advance what specific healthcare treatments we want, right? And that can be overwhelming for someone who has a lot of chronic health issues and they know that there's a lot of options or risks or concerns in the future. That can be overwhelming when you're looking at Dr. Google and Dr. Google's telling you all those potential things that could go wrong. Um, and so suddenly that becomes a psychological barrier to even engage with the process. But I think when we actually take a moment and realize it's actually just about our values and, and, and that, that it really is just about what does a good day look like for me? What makes me happy? What brings me joy? And then will this healthcare decision, when it comes, will it allow me to still be able to do those things? Mm -hmm. And, and I, think, I think that brings down some of the barriers a little bit um, that, you know, I don't think a lot of people, most of us don't work in healthcare like myself. And even as a social worker who works in healthcare, I don't understand half the things that go on here. But, but I, think, I think when it comes to healthcare, we, we feel a little overwhelmed because we don't understand everything. But what we do understand is ourselves and we know what's important to us. And we know how we like to live and we know what brings us joy. And I think if we actually just realize that that's really what advanced care planning is all about, it suddenly opens up the opportunity to start having these conversations. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more. And the time to, to do advanced care planning or participating in it is not when you're in crisis mode at all. It's not optimal. It's not, that's, you know, not, not to say that you shouldn't or can't, it's just not the optimal time. It's when we're healthy and, and enjoying, you know, all the wonderful things that we have. Um, I always say, I feel like just being born in this country, I won the lottery. I feel so grateful to, and having had lived the American experience for three years in, in Virginia many years ago, um, although I had good healthcare coverage through the embassy and whatnot, it was, it was very eye-opening to see um, how, how wonderful having a, a publicly funded universal healthcare system is, but we're not, we're not perfect, but there's room for improvement. And this is one area where I really see there's great value in, in people taking some autonomy and, and being able to communicate to their, their loved ones or someone that they're entrusted with their, their most intimate thoughts. And as a substitute decision maker, for instance, is, is what is important to them. Um, so we're here to discuss the concept of a joy list, really. Um, so can you describe to me what a joy letter is to you um, and what motivated you um, to create the joy list? If you can explain that for us a bit. Yeah, so Joyless, I think, I think the concept really came about when I started working in oncology. Um, so working with individuals who were living with cancer, either newly diagnosed um, in the process of receiving treatment or at the end of life in an acute care setting. And um, what I found is that for a lot of people, they were obviously, and, and you as a cancer survivor can relate, you're having to make some pretty, what feel like serious decisions all the time. Um, especially if you've had one treatment and either it was successful for a period of time and you now need to decide whether to make another. And so for me, when I understood that values are at the heart of advanced care planning, I didn't understand how I could go to someone's bedside and ask them, what are your values? Because I realized if someone asked me that question, I don't know how to answer it either. It feels far too abstract to be able to name values. But what I did know is that if I asked someone what brings them joy, that that actually informs what our values are when we reflect on how, what, are, what are the things that bring us joy. 
But then I wanted to go a step further than that. And I kind of talked about how before that, when I was working in the field of HIV AIDS, that I was doing a lot of conversations around what brought people joy. But I actually wanted to make a list. For me, I, I, I like to be more action focused um, than just even just the conversation and the dialogue. So I would actually sit down with my patients and I would say, let's write down at least three things that bring you joy. And, and usually those three would quickly turn into seven, 10, or 20. Um, for some people, they could only think of two things. Um, so I, there's no requirement about how long that joy list needs to be. But what I found with that is that, and I can think of specific examples, what I found what a joy list could do in addition to helping with advanced care planning is first, it grounds the individual. So whether or not you're faced with a health crisis or not, just taking a moment to reflect on what brings you joy grounds you in a life that's very uncertain. And if anything's reminded us about how uncertain life is, it's COVID-19. And as we live in that uncertainty, having the opportunity to stop for a minute and just write down a few of the things that bring us joy allows us to be a little more grounded in what's important in our lives and what we do have control over. The second thing that I love what a joy list does and what I observed that it did for the patients that I worked with, the families, as well as in my own life, is that it helps the people around you know how to bring you joy. So especially if you are sick or facing a health issue, the people around you feel very powerless. They feel very out of control. And so having a list that you can provide them where they're just like, wow, like I can, I can remember a mom who was at the end of her life and she had two young children, four and six years old. Um, and, and she had quite severe cancer that was uh, no longer treatable. And uh, I'll try not to get emotional, but for this mom to be able to give her four and six year old a list of the things that could bring her joy and that they could still do to feel like they had a sense of control was such a gift that these kids were able to say, hey, we can't take away the cancer or we can't give mom another medicine that's gonna help her, but we can watch her favorite movie with her because she wrote that on her joy list. Or we can bring her her favorite food because she wrote that on her joy list. And so again, a second thing that I feel like a joy list does in addition to grounding you is it helps the people around you know how to bring you joy. I always joke that by having my wife's joy list, I get to be a better husband because I know exactly what brings my wife joy and how to be able to add those things to her life. And then obviously that third area of what a, a joy list did for my patients and their families and for myself is that then it allowed them to make better healthcare decisions. So that when that physician was walking in the room and offering another treatment or, or providing different interventions or options that were on the table, they were able to literally hand over their joy list to the physician and say, will I still be able to do these things? And if the answer was yes, the decision was quite easy. If the answer was no, and I would talk about this with my patients, we might have to do some trade-offs. We might have to give up some things in order to have other things, and that's okay. Um, but it's again, it's prioritizing what's important to you on your joy list. Now it makes me want to say that the next iteration of advanced care planning workbooks, I want that to be a component of everybody's, everybody's workbook or guide that they go through when they're looking at creating their advanced care plan. Um, for their future health care needs is the creation of a joy list as a starting point and thinking about what matters to you. Because it's because it's doable, right? I don't I don't think there's a single person I can again I can think of the patient who looked at me with a blank stare on his face, completely exhausted for months and months of chemotherapy, wondering what is it that brings him joy. And then in the end, the only thing that he could think of was ordering pizza and watching CNN. And and again that might not bring me any joy at all, but to him, it did. And we were able to then make healthcare decisions that would allow him to still order pizza and watch CNN. So I love, what I love about Joyless is that I think it makes it accessible, it makes it possible, and it does more than just good advanced care planning. Like I, that, I, think, I think that's what I got excited about is as I started to realize what a Joyless could offer patients and families is that it doesn't just... Um, help you in making good informed healthcare decisions. It also just helps the people around you as well. And it helps to ground you. And uh, I would always love turning to the family around the bed and asking them what was on their joy list too. Again, to normalize that advanced care planning isn't just for the patient who's sick, it's for everyone. And so while it's easy for you to look at your mom or your daughter um, or your cousin who's in the bed sick and ask them what's on their joy list so that they make good healthcare decisions, I want to talk about what's on your joy list too, so we can normalize this experience for all of us. 
I love it. I, I really love it. I, I know as a, a Christian and heading into the holiday season um, in the next short while, um, if someone says, what do you want for, for Christmas? That's what I'm going to ask for is I would like your joy list. I, 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 now I'm, I just, I really love the concept of it, of it, Andrew. It's not uh, copyrighted or trademarked anywhere. <laughs> not yet, not yet. But, 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 but after this conversation, I might go and pursue it. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, so I guess I, I really, really love that. And I think it'll resonate with um, our, our followers and advanced care planning who are listening. It's just, it's so simple. It, it really is. It's not complicated, and and that's really what it comes down to. It's it, and I often like to phrase advanced care planning. It's it's not about end of life care, and and trying to move away from that as much as possible. It's about how well do you want to live until the end, yep. right? And and we don't know when that's coming. Obviously, um, be nice if we did have that crystal ball, but it's about how well do you want to live until you're gone one day and and by resonating and thinking about and sharing with those in your circle of trust and your your the ones your nearest and dearest whoever they may be or whomever they may be um it's just such a beautiful um beautiful and uncomplicated way to communicate that so i, I really appreciate you sharing and and helping to to help others discover the simplicity of creating their own joy list and the benefits that I have, not just to themselves and how they feel, but also to the ones that they care about. And it's all about how we care for one another when it comes down to it at the end of the day too, right? Well, and, and Laurel, um, you named it. It, it. it is the best gift that you could give. Like without sounding ridiculously cliche, um, it really is the best gift that you could give be, uh, both in the context of advanced care planning and in the context of you just knowing now how to bring joy to the people who are important to you. Um, and so like my parents, I'm their substitute decision makers. Um, and when they were asking, you know, where do we begin? I was just like, have a date night and just write down your joy list. Like that's what my wife and I did. We've got them on our phones and we can update them. It's a live document that we can constantly update because what brings us joy changes over time. I, I joke with people that right now, while my kids are one and six, they're definitely on my joy list. But when they're teenagers, they might not be on my joy list anymore. Um, and then foods and the activities that we like to do, like a joy list is not exhaustive uh, in any way. And, and you know, my joy list started with just 10 and it very quickly grew to 50. And what led to 50 was once I started thinking about foods that bring me joy. Um, and, and once I started thinking about genres of music or movies or, um, you know, and it doesn't just have to be that cliche, oh, these are the people that bring me joy. Yes, people might bring you joy. But for me also, you know, reading a good book brings me equally as much joy. Um, and so I think, I think it was a great way for my parents to at least feel like, oh, where do I begin? And, I, and, and what do we do with this? And then for me, as I said, with my wife, I feel far more confident going into that very emotional crisis, not just a health crisis, but that emotional crisis, if there ever was a time that I had to be her substitute decision maker, that I could pull out her joy list and have a conversation with the physician or the healthcare providers around what she could or could not still be able to do after that intervention, um, rather than f panicking in that moment and wondering, how does my wife like to live? That's a really difficult moment, excuse me, moment of crisis to have to actually even tap into that part of our brain that's so grounded to remember those things. But when you actually have that list, um, it can be incredibly helpful. Yeah, yeah. So again, coming full circle, it is, it's really truly the greatest gift that you can give to someone that you love and care about, because then you're not leaving them suffering through, did I do the right thing? Did I make the right decision? Is that what he or she would have wanted? Um, it's clearly articulated for you well in advance. And I love that you keep it as a, an evergreen document that keeps growing and changing and morphing and molding. I, because we do, we're not the same people that we were when we're 20 and when we're 30 and well, 40 and 50 <laughs> and above, and you're so much younger. But um, I really love that concept of it. Um, so do you feel like, I guess this kind of goes a little bit in advance. I'd love to see this incorporated as part of everyone's um, advanced care planning. Is Do you feel that it has the space to live uh, and breathe within advanced care planning? Um, and do you find that your joy list has helped you start the conversation around advanced care planning with your family? And you've already really answered that. And that was what I was gonna ask you next. Um, you quite clearly you've been able to help your parents and 
Um, are there any other examples of other people that you've shared it with that they've, you know, said, you know, namaste, thank you, Andrew, for, for sharing that, that um, it, it meant a lot and it turned their, their thought process or made them more aware about what advanced care planning is and the importance of it and how it can actually help people? Yeah, so I'll, I can share a story of a really close friend of ours um, who lives in the States. Uh, my wife's American, so so half of our friends are in the United States. And uh, back back when we used to be able to travel, uh, I don't know if we all remember that time, pre-COVID. Um, so the beginning of this year, her family, she comes from a large family with lots of kids like yourself, um, and she they were traveling to Mexico to go on a vacation. And it was the first time in years that the whole family would begin together. So she called us up, my wife and I up uh, just before the trip and said, Andrew, I know you do advanced care planning. I feel like this trip is gonna be an ideal opportunity to have these conversations with my whole family, but especially with my parents, what kind of questions should I ask? And so I gave a few suggestions, but I just said, if you, if you ask no other question other than what is it that brings you joy? Um, I was like, that's, that's going to be the question that's going to help and support you and your family the most in having those conversations. I was like, and the best part about that question is that your siblings hopefully would be able to answer it and not just feel like we're asking the old parents in the room um, what brings them joy. So they returned from their vacation. She called us up and told us just the great late night conversations about what bring them joy they were able to have. And ironically, the timing couldn't have been better because a few weeks later, um, her dad unexpectedly got COVID-19 and was intubated on a breathing machine in the ICU for four weeks. Um, and during that time, obviously, was unable to communicate for himself. And so in the midst of, this was at the very start of the, the pandemic, so it was back in March. There were so many unknowns and uncertainties during that time. But what, what I can tell you is that in the midst of all the grief, the uncertainty, and the fear um, that this family was going through, they were reassured that they knew exactly how dad wanted to live. And she told that to me repeatedly. She was, she was able to repeatedly tell me that, Andrew, we knew, you know, while we couldn't be there in the same room with him and we were the ones having to make the decisions, we knew exactly how he wanted to live because of those conversations about what brought him joy we had in Mexico. And so I think that's the gift that we can offer um, and that I've seen over and over again. I've also seen the gift of what, what a joyless can offer even for those people who, um, again, in our daily lives, I used to tell my patients who were maybe struggling with mental health issues, which let's be honest, during COVID-19, a lot of us are, anxiety is creeping up more than we would like to, potentially feeling depression as well. Um, I find that if we write down that joy list and we put it on our, on our fridge or somewhere where we can visibly see it, maybe on our phone or on our computer, that on those days when we're not feeling a lot of joy, again, we've got an immediate resource to access. We don't have to take the time to actually think about it or to, to, to come up with any coping strategies. We've already created that list of things that brings us joy that we can actually refer to. So I've seen that as well during the, this pandemic, especially I've seen people who've taken that concept of the joy list and that it hasn't only just helped them with the idea of around advanced care planning, but it's also just helped them with their mental health and their coping during times of uncertainty. And then to get back to your question about how does this fit with advanced care planning, here in Fraser Health, we love the five steps of advanced care planning um, that you and the national organization have put together, which are, you know, think, learn, decide, talk, and record. And that think section is that time when, we're, when, when we need to think about our values. And again, what are our values? Well, again, I think we think about what a good day looks like or what brings us joy, what brings meaning to our life. And I always tell people when I think about those five steps, um, that's the most important part. Uh, the next, the next, in my opinion, well, yes, learning is important and so is deciding on your substitute decision maker, but the next is the talk. I tell people if they did only two steps of those five is that they thought about what was important to them and what brought them joy. And then they share that with others. That would be the gift. Then if I had never assigned someone to be my substitute decision maker, even in a health crisis, they would still know what was important to me. Then if I had never recorded a single thing about what was important to me, they would still remember the joy list that we had talked about um, and that I had shared with them. If I had never uh, learned about what was actually going on with my health or learned about the laws that influenced my healthcare decisions in that learn step, that's okay. They would still know what was important and meaningful and brought me joy and would still be empowered to be able to make those decisions that I would want. Um, and so I think, I think it, it very perfectly fits into advanced care planning and really helps people conceptualize that idea around values that again, I think can be far too abstract and, and just creates a psychological barrier to even engage in, in the idea. 
you're like a true pioneer. Um, I, I think, you know, we need to replace the, you know, the think with, you know, put adding in there, creating your joy list. Uh, and I, I'd like to take the moment too to acknowledge and, and to ask you to share with your wife for allowing her to, or for you to be able to pass along that story about um, her family's experience with her dad, um, that that's very gracious of her. And, and we're grateful for, for you to share that with us um, through what must have been an extremely painful painful time but as you say it provided some comfort to the family knowing um and i love the example too that you gave that even if somebody hasn't you know completed as we would like people to do so that it has some some legs and some uh, legitimacy to it um and being able to speak for you and when you're not able to in medical interventions one day but even the simple act of creating your joy list will help people and not be left with the unknowns and I've lost both my parents and um you know it was definitely easier going around the second time um but the first time it was you know is that what she would have wanted Did, you know what were her favorite flowers like it left so many unanswered questions and my dad it was a little more simple because he was more open to talking about it um before he passed away but it really truly is it's it's one of the greatest gifts that you can possibly do for your give to your loved ones so um, well, and this, and this is a season, this is a season, right? Like this is a season of joy. I think we're seeing the word joy during Christmas. We see it. And during the holiday season, we see the word joy in more places than we've ever seen it before. And if any time COVID-19 has really made us reflect on what brings us joy, because so many of the things that potentially brought us joy before have either been restricted or taken away. And so it's just reminded us, wow, that really does bring me joy. That really is important to me. Um, and so I think both this season and this time period of COVID um, is both the opportune moment for us to really think about what brings us joy and to write it down in a way that we can share it with others. Yeah, if anything, it's, you know, hopefully provided people with um, a reason to pause for some personal reflection and realizing really at the end of the day, it's not the materialistic things so much um, as it is the things that are closest to us, but it's being able to share that with others. So I really wanted to thank you um, for joining us today for this conversation. And um, who knows, maybe we'll have an opportunity to expand on this a little bit further and, and have it integrated as part of advanced care planning. But I, I'm very grateful to you for sharing this today. Um, and so I hope that your knee has is, is gotten better as well um, and that you're able to, to run alongside Capri. And pretty soon you'll be having a hard time keeping up with the younger one too. Absolutely. As they get a little steadier on his, um, it's a son that you have that's the younger. Yeah, yeah so he's, any day now he'll be running a mile a minute. <laughs> Um, but in closing, on behalf of the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association and Advanced Care Planning in Canada Initiative, I would like to thank you, Andrew, for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and ideas. So for more information or to reach out to Andrew, you could contact him at, if you're comfortable sharing an email, Andrew? Uh, absolutely. Feel free to reach out. Uh, my email address is andrew.saunderson, S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S-O-N, at fraserhealth.ca. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and for those of you who'd like more information uh, about advanced care planning and completing your workbook or just looking at some of the resources that we have for you, our website address is www.advancecareplanning. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. So in the meantime, I wish you all well. Um, so be safe and uh, till next time.